The, uh, the idea of this afternoon is to look at just some of the parables which Jesus used nature. A parable is a story which has a meaning. And in some, you're able to put very, very tight meanings on most parts. In others, it's, the meaning is much more general. Well, the chapter we've just read, Matthew chapter 13, is taking us right back 2,000 years ago, long before the days of tractors and machinery. And to sow seed, the sower strapped um, a bag round his waist, walked up and down the field and broadcast, took his hand of seed and threw it into the ground. And, of course, because in those days you didn't have pavements and you didn't have real markers for the fields, some of the seed fell in places where it was never going to grow, but he still sowed it. And if you think that Jesus is the sower and he is sowing the Bible, the message of the scriptures, then we've got the way in which us people respond to the Word of God. And some of you who are here or watching this will uh, realise that perhaps your next door neighbour isn't the slightest bit interested, but somebody down the road has shown a little bit of interest. So just imagine that um, there's four types of ground which Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 4, some fell by the wayside, some fell in verse 5 on stony places, some, verse 7, fell, fell among thorns, and other fell on good ground, verse 8. So, what Jesus did, and he probably prepared this at least the night before, and he knew exactly what he was going to say, that people will respond to the gospel in the same way as you and I respond to certain things. The sower throws his seed out, and because part of his field was used as a footpath, it was hard trodden down. And the birds came and ate it up, and it didn't have any chance of growing. It just was not possible that that seed would grow. The ground was too high, hard, and the birds very soon came and ate it up. Then some seed fell on stony ground, and stony ground very often, unlike the picture, you can't really see that it's stones. There's often just a little bit of soil and underneath are the rocks and the few parts which do be able to grow are then um, rather wizened and don't get the energy they need from the soil. And then the third lot of um, Seed in verse 7 fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And in other words, the wheat grew, grew much taller than the tiny bit of wheat, and the poor little shoot of wheat was smothered, and all the nutrients out of the soil was taken by the thorns. And then, of course, other fell on good ground. Now, just think of yourself and the way you might respond. Say there's somebody in the street, in the marketplace, selling something. Um, to use a silly illustration, I've never been fishing and I've no likelihood to go fishing and it doesn't interest me to oats. But if there's a man talking about fishing or talking about things which don't interest me, I'm just like the pathway, and what he is sowing won't grow in my mind, and something else interests eat it up. Now, some people are like that with the Word of God. But the Word of God 
comes from the Bible and we all share the same Bible. It doesn't matter what version we use. There's some very good modern in English translations today which makes it easier to, under, to understand. And some people just will not respond and therefore it's like sowing the seed on the pathway. But you give them an opportunity. You don't say, oh, I won't sow there. I'll walk along the path. You never know. Uh, some animal might scratch the seed and it might go through the hard earth and it might start to grow. So if I'm a preacher, I must never say, oh, I'm not going to talk to you or you. I don't think you'll respond. Jesus spent his life telling people, all sorts of people, this message from God. The, uh, the stony ground on the, the top right is the uh, people who, yes, they'll have a little bit of interest. Say so they might read the leaflet you give them. They might go to church once or twice. Oh, but to be perfectly honest, they've got so many things in life and it never sinks in, it never alters their behaviour, and so therefore it's a waste again. The thorns are the people who, oh yes, I like that, I'll read the Bible, yes, give me a Bible reading planner, help me to go through and find the right chapters, tell me about it. Two or three days later, something else comes into their mind. They get hooked on the television programme or they get very busy at work. And so many things crowd their life that the poor little bit of religion just gets smothered and grown over. And so the seed doesn't grow there. And then the good ground on the bottom right these are the people who respond. Let me read, I'm using the old uh, King James Version. Other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, or we'd say a hundred percent, some sixty percent, and some thirty percent. In other words, some of us will respond with all we've got, that's a hundred percent, some will try to juggle all the other interests in life and some will just be a nominal sort of Christian. So what Jesus was saying is very, very appropriate to people in his day, despite the fact of the old way of sowing the seed, but it's the way people today, perhaps you, are responding to the word of God, whether it grows really well and everything else gets pushed out, or it makes a little effort, or it gets smothered, or it doesn't have enough root, or it never stands a chance. So there's an introduction to the parables Jesus told about nature, and if you think I've made those meanings up, just check in verse 18 onwards, and he says exactly what I've said, from 18 down to 23, how the seed grows in some places better than others and in some places or in some people's hearts, not at all. Huge lesson for all of us. What importance does this word of God have in our minds? Now, I want to take you back to the Gospel of Mark. We'll come back to Matthew in a minute. Because here is another story Jesus told, and Mark tells us in chapter 4, verse 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, same idea, casting seed to the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed shall spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, 
immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. And this is a short story about a very patient farmer, Organa, who sows his seed, he goes to bed and he wakes up and he goes to bed and he wakes up and days and months go by and he is fast asleep for a good half the time and the seed grows despite him. In other words, perhaps through this very talk this afternoon, God is saying to us, well, I know you're going to go to sleep, I know you're going to go to work, I know you're going to think of other things, but if you've got an honest and good heart, honest and good ground, then the seed will grow. And that's one of the miracles of Christianity, because what the Bible teaches us is the way to everlasting life. And if some people think, I'm not interested, I'm not bothered, the seed doesn't grow at all, as we saw in the previous parable. So the story of the patient gardener is uh, one which God then lets the seed uh, grow. And it's not a bad idea, as we started this meeting with prayer, to ask a simple prayer, please God, let the seed grow in my mind. And, of course, God is capable of doing that. I'm going back now to Matthew, and Matthew chapter 6. I'll put these words on the screen. Matthew 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or get a store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I've taken all these verses from the New International Version. I thought it would make it easier. Are you not much more valuable than they? So look at the birds. They don't have the intelligence, the Bible, the words, and the hearing, which us humans do. And yet birds manage extremely well. It's not by chance. It's by the hand of God. It's by the power of God. And this is a lovely verse which tells us that God is nature. That when we see the birds looking for food or picking up seeds or having a bath in the, uh, in the water, then we've got to realise that the whole of nature is just one part of what God is and does. And to understand nature helps us to understand God. Well, the context of this is where he's been saying, oh, come on, people, you spend far too long thinking about what you're going to eat tomorrow, what you're going to wear next week, how you're going to do this or that. Take no thought, he says in verse 31, what we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed. For after all these things that the Gentiles, the unbelievers, seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God. Make that our number one priority. And all these things will be added unto you. If God takes care of the birds, surely he will provide for us too. So just in those three little uh, stories, parables, made up stories, which Jesus told the people to illustrate his point, we can begin to see how that the word is the seed, it grows in people's hearts and if their mind, if their ground is fertile, it will grow and it will lead to the kingdom of heaven. And that's the reward of the righteous. We pray, thy kingdom come. Now, he told another parable um, about a net. And it might have been that sort of net 
where the fisherman simply throws it, the edge of it is weighted, it sinks down through the water, and then he pulls it in, and it gathers all sorts of fishes. This is in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 47. So Matthew 13 and verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, same thing, is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. Now, this is where we're moving on a stage. The angels shall come forth and sever or separate the wicked from among the just. You'll keep the good fish, you'll throw the bad fish away. And it might have been a net like that. It might have been a drag net like that, which needs two people at least to operate it, and they drag it through the water and everything in it, as the two fisher people close up together, then they encompass a lot of old tin cans, probably an Asda trolley or two, but quite a lot of fish. And then not all the fish are appropriate. Some might be poisonous, some might not be in season. So they sit down and they separate the good from the bad. And this is beginning to lead us on to the next point, which is well illustrated in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. This Matthew 13 is a chapter absolutely full of um, little stories Jesus made up to teach people. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares or weeds among the wheat and went his way. Now I can't imagine this happening today. Really, really, I can't imagine any farmer's enemy going out in the middle of the night and sowing weeds in the same field as the farmer has sowed his good seed. But it's a story which I'm sure we can understand. When the blade was sprung up, verse 26, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And the weeds and the wheat are all mingled in together. And the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? Where's the weeds come from? He said, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Will you that we go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye first the weeds, or the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And this, my friends, just like the previous one of the dragnet, is talking about a judgment. That it's not really up to us what we do and how we appropriate the word of God. It's not really up to us to say, well, I'm going to believe in this and I'm going to believe in that. Or as people sometimes say, all roads lead to the same place. It's not that at all. There is going to be, at the time when Jesus comes back, a judgment. And Paul says in Corinthians, we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So the fishes which were sorted out, the weeds and the wheat which were sorted out, have these two distinct meanings that there's some people who are good, godly, and try to do the right thing, and the others who think that they're okay by themselves and they don't need 
the rest of Scripture. Well, the next two parables I want to mention have two possible ways to understand them. In Matthew chapter 13, the same chapter, he talks about a tiny grain of mustard seed which is sown in the ground, a very small seed, and he took it and sowed it in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. In other words, here is something small which has very large uh, end results. Then the leaven or the yeast we call it today. Tiny, tiny little grains but it makes such a difference to that lump of dough. It grows and grows. Now the simple meaning, and I think the traditional sort of meaning for this, is that the kingdom of God, the people who respond to the gospel and who accept the Bible teaching, are going to grow into something very big, and eventually will fill the whole earth after, of course, God has sorted everything out at the judgment. There is another meaning for both of these, and it could be that when the mustard seed is very small and it's sown, it then grows completely out of proportion to the seed it originally came from. And when you look in verse 32 of Matthew 13, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now that could be the birds of the air and the animals represent the nations of the world. And do you know, within 300 years of Christianity starting with Jesus, it had become the official religion of the Roman Empire. And very, very soon after that, there was the Council of Nicaea, which had a vote. Do we accept three gods or one god? The three gods had it, there was a vote, and from that time on, Christianity in the main has worshipped the Trinity. Do you know, my friends, I just cannot find one word in the Bible which mentions the Trinity. But so many people around us today believe in that and these two parables might mean the nice meaning where the kingdom is going to grow and lots of folks are going to come into it or it might be the, the uh, reverse of that where it starts off small and then becomes too big for its own good, has votes has man-made um, distinctions and definitions. Books are written about what people ought to believe. And you've got all sorts of wrong doctrines which unfortunately do seem to have crept into Christianity. Let me take you to the same chapter, Matthew chapter 13, not on the screen, and verse 44. Um, there's a man which finds hidden treasure. He's walking home, he's taking a shortcut through a field, he trips over something and it looks like a handle. And he pulls and he pulls and he moves the weeds and he pulls and it's a treasure chest and it's full of gold coins. Wow, I wasn't looking for that, but look what has happened now, I found it. So he hides it, sells all he has, buys the field, and then the treasure is his. There's a similar story in the next two verses. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Now the difference with this is, the one man who was going through the field is not looking for treasure. 
Verse 45, the pearl merchant is looking for treasure. Who, when he's found one pearl of great price, he sells his whole collection and buys it. And he is a very happy, rich man. Now again, putting those two in the same sequence in this chapter, you've got perhaps yourself, who hasn't really been looking for the truth, just going home through a field, and you find it. And what you've got to do is to get rid of all your other interests, or else you're going to be like the stones and the, and the thorns. Other things choke the word. You've now got rid of everything else and you can accept the kingdom as your own. And then in verse 45 and 46, perhaps you're like the person who's been looking for the right church, the right doctrine, the right idea, who suddenly finds something and perhaps if God's using us this afternoon, it might be that a part of scripture suddenly comes out and hits us like it's never hit us before. And then, again, you have to get rid of everything else in your life and accept Christ's Christianity. Right, well, the, the last one I want to talk about is one which is of tremendous interest to Bible students because it uses something which starts right in Genesis and goes all the way through the Bible. That is a fig tree. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus tells this story, and you'll notice how each of the Gospel writers tell these accounts in different ways, but it, it's all the same, of course. And he spake a parable to them. This is Luke 21, verse 29. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now not. In other words, when you see little buds coming on the trees in March and April and May, then you say, spring's coming, summer's on its way. We can wear less clothes, we can turn the heating off. Um, when you these now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. <coughs> so likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And in the modern version, look at the fig tree and all the trees, when they sprout leaves, you can see them for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. And look at the bit in red. The fig tree and all the trees. Now, a little bit of research will show you that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. Right in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve went to a tree and grabbed some leaves and made themselves an apron to hide their embarrassment. But it doesn't quite say that. They went to a fig tree and they got fig leaves to make themselves aprons. Follow the idea of figs all the way through the scripture Hezekiah, the king who was going to die, was told to have a poultice of figs and his bad place healed. And Jesus is here saying, Behold all the trees. No, he doesn't. He says, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Well, Israel, if we're talking about budding out, and Israel, the land which most of the Bible is about, gained their independence in 1948. And a quick count up of the internet of other nations which have become independent since 1948, I made 45. In other words, that's a huge number of new nations 
which have been born since Israel. I'm not talking about the Middle Ages. I'm not talking about the time of Jesus. I'm not talking just about back in the days of the, uh, the Greeks and the, uh, the, uh, the Romans. Jesus says, when you see the fig tree start to blossom, when Israel becomes independent, and so many other nations become independent, even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. We are not political, but we watch Israel very closely, and you will have seen all the world leaders assembled this week in Jerusalem for the uh, funeral of Shimon Peres. And Israel is a force for good or bad in the world today. Whereas in my grandmother's days, there wasn't an Israel. It wasn't a force. It wasn't a nation. So when you see Israel and all the other nations really uh, shooting forth, growing, and I'm talking about the days in which we live now, the 21st century, then you know that the kingdom of heaven is coming. When you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Well, my friends, just a very brief look at some of the parables from nature, and of course there are a lot more. Just to summarise, how people respond, how do you respond when that seed is sown? How are you responding to what the Bible says is a message to save men and women? We saw that God's seed will grow, sometimes very, very uh, largely into big trees and lumps of dough. God will provide, as he has done for the birds. There will be a judgment, there will be a sorting out, and to be honest, my friends, you really can't say, I'll do as I like, if you're going to take on this kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is coming. When Jesus spoke about nature, he spoke about the world in which he lived. We've been able this afternoon to see just a little bit of what the Bible says, and it's right up to date about the world in which we live. How, my friends, are you going to respond? Over to you.